Before we start, I want to say a prayer. God, thank you so much for this incredible opportunity for us to gather together and to learn your word. Lord, I pray that whatever's going on outside does not affect our time here with you. We are here for you, and you are our greatest desire. I pray that the words I speak would be inspired by you and not my own. We love you, we praise you, we magnify you, and we pray all these things in the name of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Bible. Bible confession. I'm learning. If you would raise your Bible, please, or your cell phone, depending on who you are, say it with me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I will do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God, and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, pastor's regular thing to do is to go through the Bible verse by verse. And I want to do that with you guys tonight. Just what I've been reading, what God has shown me, and he's laid on my heart. I don't think I'm going to keep you very long. And if I do, don't say I didn't warn you. But we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1. And uh, 1 John's unique for the New Testament epistles. Because when you look at the New Testament, the Gospels really don't belong in the New Testament. They establish the New Testament, but they, they're, they're on the in-between, between the Old and the New. The New Testament really starts in Acts when Jesus ascends, and the disciples go out and do kingdom work. But 1 John is the only epistle that doesn't contain a greeting in the beginning. It doesn't have any personal messages to it at all. Uh, I believe John was on the Isle of Patmos. He had already been exiled when he wrote this epistle. And it wasn't to a specific church either, the way that Galatians and Ephesians and First and Second Thessalonians were. Nor was it written to an individual like Timothy or Titus or Philemon or whoever. It was just sort of a memo to the church about some of the things that they had had happening. And it was telling them, as we will see, what to base your faith in. Later on in, the, in 1 John, he talks about how to identify false teachers, how to go through and get rid of them effectively, how we are supposed to walk in the light, as Jesus called us to. And if I can get to the chapter, here we go. It starts out, I will be using uh, King James, New King James up here to read, and then I'll also read from the New Living Translation and the Amplified. Uh, start with the King James, please. John, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 1. I don't have it printed out. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Take out all the commas. Oh, there it is. I, I was going to stick with verse 1 for a little bit. If you take out the commas in verse 1, you get rid of which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and which our hands have handled. That which was from the beginning of the word of life. Now, I did a little verse study. Beginning is the Greek word archi. RK, that's how it's pronounced. Translated to mean first. So that which was first was the word of life. The word of life translates from the Greek words logos and zao, translating to mean the divine expression of life. Now we know from the Gospel of John and from John's other writings that the word is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was in the beginning like John said in, gospel, in his gospel in the first chapter. And he is on earth God's expression of what our life should be like. 
He's what we model ourselves after, not because he was a great teacher or a great human being, but because he was our Savior, and he's who God designed each of us to look like. He was the first person to do it successfully, to be holy man and holy God. But we, so graciously through salvation, have been allowed and called to be Jesus to this world to show his image and do mighty works that he tells us to do. It's an incredible blessing. It's amazing. Now in verse 2, please. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Another way to say that is, we have seen, we testify, and we declare that Jesus was with the Father and has been lightened, shown, or rendered apparent to us. He was made plain. He's not a mystery anymore. He's not a symbol the way he was throughout the entire Old Testament. He's right there. And verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We declare these things to everyone else so that they may enter into a partnership with us because we have a partnership with the Father and his Son, Jesus. And God goes through and he inspires the writer of Hebrews to talk more about this. I think it's in Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 4. I can't recall off the top of my head, though I should. That we are made joint heirs. We are in a partnership with Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father. This is how we get to boldly approach the throne of grace. And we get not to come through sacrifices that could never fully cover our sin, but through Jesus who did and who looks at us with love and compassion in the middle of our worst times that he knew we would go through and he has made a way for us out of, he sees us and he's our partner. He's our high priest. He's the anointed one, the holy one. If we can move on to verse four now, because I could keep talking about that for a while. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now in the book of 1 John, that is the end of the introduction. And we write these things to you that your joy may be full. The Greek word for joy is karo, meaning cheerfulness or calm delight. Or to be well off. Not to disagree with the Bible because that would be wrong on my part, but joy is more than a calm delight. Webster in the 1828 dictionary, called joy the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. That excitement of pleasurable feelings which is caused by success, good fortune, the gratification of desire or some good possessed, or by a rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. Gladness, exaltation, exhilaration of spirits. Joy is a delight of the mind from the consideration of the present or assured approaching possession of a good. Joy is the result of faith. You can't have joy at what's coming if you don't believe that it's going to be there. When your kid gets off the bus from their first day of kindergarten, you have joy, A, that they made it back and the teacher didn't kill them because you've lived with them for five years and you know what they're like. And be that they're your child and you want good things for them and you are so happy that they made it off the bus and they're there with you. And you get to spend your time with them. God loves us more than that. We have joy, this overflowing, abundant, living water. Rivers of living water flow out of you. You know what lives in water? Everything. Science says our bodies are made up of roughly 70% water little over two-thirds. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. We don't even know what's in all the water yet because it goes so deep we can't get there. They make these really tight little submarines that hold one person and a high-def camera, and they send them down as far as they can go, and there's still probably a mile left to get to the bottom, but the ship can't make it. Water has everything in it. 
<laughs> Sorry, science, tangents, a little bit. But your joy may be full. Can we go to the amplified version of this verse? I was going to save it for later, but I want it now. And we are now writing these things to you so that our joy in seeing you included may be full and your joy may be complete. Seeing this, this is written to other believers. This is written to the church. So that your joy may be complete and your joy may be complete because this is an encouragement and instruction that I've been given from God. And it's a joy to me that I get to tell it to you. And it's a joy to me to see you carry it out. And it's a joy to you that you know what you're doing, what God wants you to. There's joy. People, Christians walk around like the dog died. And if you has recently, I am so sorry. <laughs> but we walk around and we'd say, oh, it's another day. Works hard. I don't have time for anything. But there's a glorious hope appearing. One day, very soon, the Mount of Olives is going to split open. A river is going to flow into it, which will refresh the Dead Sea back to life using water. And we will be gone. I like what Pastor says, how we're going to float up sl slow. We're not going to be beamed up like in Star, Star Trek. But it's going to be a slow rise and you can wave to people. If you're me, you'll laugh at them and say, why weren't you coming with me? <sighs> that would be mean. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't do that. That's not nice. But we have joy, joy in these things. Are you people happy? <laughs> I see smiles, but where's the joy? Where's the joy in knowing that your God is alive and no other God in religion is? Where's your joy that Christmas is here and the annoying songs are going to start on the radio because they just don't stop? No. Not to you. <laughs> that Hymns and carols are going to start, not the secular. I'm sorry, the secular is annoying. I love Christmas carols. The Christmas carols are going to start, and you get to hear people sing about the newborn king and hark the herald angels. What child is this in a way in a manger and silent night, no holy night that needs all three verses sung in it. There's joy that we have, not just at this time of year, not just at Easter, but when you look at your checkbook and it doesn't meet what the bills tell you it needs to, <laughs> As some of you may know, Charity and I got engaged earlier this week. Yay. Thank you. And I get to embarrass her, that's a perk. Uh, and we've started budgeting. And uh, thinking naturally, thinking as a guy, as a provider, we're going over our budget. And we realized about how much we need to save every paycheck. And I argued with God this morning about my tithe and offering because I was like, I need to save that money. And the little voice said, why aren't you just going to give it to me and let me take care of it then? <laughs> you know, the checkbook doesn't meet what I think it should. There's not enough left over to what I think. But God's got it taken care of. And I've got joy in knowing that my provision is already there. I have already been provided for. So we write these things about the word and the light coming down to us and dying for us and being raised again so that your joy may be full. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse 5 or I'll keep, walking. I'll keep talking this. Uh, King James Version, please. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I like going through the words in verses, because English is not a terribly good translation. There are four words for love in Greek, and there's one in English, so it helps to know which one you're talking about. So the better translation of this that I found based on the Greek was, the announcement that we have heard and announced to you directly with no modification, no human interference, what has been announced to us and we announced to you is that the supreme divinity of God is luminousness or fire and light. And in him, there is the absolute negative or not even one of shadow and darkness. 
This is the same statement that was made about God by James in James 1.17, where he says, For every good and wonderful gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is the same to this exiled disciple on Patmos, and it's the same to James, brother of Jesus. Half-brother of Jesus. <laughs> that your joy may be full. Oh, gracious. And on to verse 6, if you would please. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we profess to walk in partnership, I like partnership more than fellowship because it puts you right there with him. If we profess to walk in a partnership with God and we tread all about in the shadow that God has no part of, we utter an untruth and make the absolute negative of truth. This is part of John getting into the meat of what he's talking to the church about. That there are going to be people who say that they're a Christian and they walk around. Lifeless. Dead. As Paul says in one of his letters, you act like you're dead, why don't you, why don't you be alive? Why don't you have joy? Why don't you go out and spread the good news? You're walking around and we can't really tell that you accepted Jesus. We can't really see it from the things you say and how you act and how you react to things. Because you don't, you don't always have a choice about what happens, but you have every ounce of the decision in how you react to what happens. So the people where, you know, the taxes on their new car are higher than what they would have liked to have been. So instead of cursing the government, you thank God that you get to do the right thing. Because when you obey, you're in his hand and under his blessings. And he won't, he won't take his hand off you. But when you disobey, the blessing may not be there. Because you removed it. Alright. Uh, verse 7. This is going to be our last verse tonight. But if we walk in the light, as he should be capitalized. He is in the light. We have partnership one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The literal blood of Jesus Messiah, which is what Christ means, God's son, cleans us from the entire offense if we do walk in our partnership with him. And we know that God has already cleansed us of our sin. But as pastor has said time and again, there should be a change in us. You know, there's a song, Great Change. Great change since I've been born. The things I used to would do, the way I used to, the road I used to would walk, all these things. There's been a great change since I've been born. I don't do those things no more. Because I'm walking in partnership with God on the straight and narrow. I'm walking in the light. <laughs> I'm not walking in the darkness. My joy is full. And the literal blood of Jesus Christ, his son, clean, has cleansed me from every offense. And the name of Jesus Christ is above everything. Jesus is Hebrew. Chain, Jesus is the Greek word, if I remember right, for Joshua. It's not an uncommon name now. But in Hebrew, Joshua is Savior. As Joshua was in the Old Testament. Our Savior is literally named Savior Messiah. The two best things that we have ever had is Jesus and nothing else. I'm going to read through these in the New Living and then in the Amplified. And that's all I have for you tonight, if I remember correctly. Yep, it is. So in the New Living, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This, is, this one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you that we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing 
these things so that you may fully share in our joy. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So, if we, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God, as in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And once more in the Amplified, please. I really like this one. I like how it's wordy. We are writing about the word of life in him who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen with our own eyes, whom we have gazed upon for ourselves and have touched with our own hands. And the life and aspect of his being was revealed, made manifest, demonstrated. And we saw as eyewitnesses and are testifying to declare to you the life, the eternal life in him who already existed with the Father and who actually was made visible, was revealed to us, his followers. What we have seen and ourselves heard, we are also telling you so that you too may realize and enjoy fellowship as partners and partakers with us. And this fellowship that we have, which is a distinguishing mark of Christians, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And we are now writing these things to you so that our joy in seeing you included may be full and your joy may be complete. And this is the message, the message of promise, which we have heard from him and, are now, and now are reporting to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. No, not in any way. So if we say we are partakers together and enjoy fellowship with him, when we live and move and are walking about in darkness, we are both speaking falsely and do not live and practice the truth which the gospel presents. But if we really are living and walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, removes us from all sin and guilt, keeps us cleansed, from sin in all its forms and manifestations. Do we have something to be happy about? I'm sorry, a dog would have barked over you. Do we have something to be happy about? Yes, there we go. So we write these things to you and I share these things with you that you may have complete joy. And as the Bible says in another passage, so that we may know what is the breadth and the length and the width and the height and the depth of our Savior's love for us? And if you'd be kind enough to stand up with me, please, I'm going to lead it in a prayer. I will be up here for prayer after if there is something going on that has stolen your joy. Some way the enemy has come in and taken that from you when he has no right to do so to our children of God. And if you are not saved, now is an incredible opportunity to get to know and start your partnership with Jesus. I'll give you an inside tip. Let him do all the heavy lifting. Just do what he tells you. All right, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes, repeat after me. God, thank you so much for the gift of your son and the joy that you have given us. We believe and we receive the joy that you have in store for us. We will not let it be stolen. We will not let it be taken. It is ours, and we hold on to it. We thank you, Father, and we believe in what you say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.